Welcome to a new journey through the wonders of ancient Egypt. In this video, we will explore one of the intriguing subsidiary pyramids in the Giza East field of the Giza Necropolis, the G1B Pyramid. Situated just 10 meters south of the Great Pyramid of Giza, it is part of the fourth dynasty of ancient Egypt. G1B is one of three pyramids dedicated to queens, centrally located among the trio near G1A. Various hypotheses surround the identity of the queen for whom this pyramid was built, with Egyptologists like Mark Lenner and Rainer Stadelman attributing it to Queen the I, while Dr. Zahi Horus associates it with Queen Nubat, the mother of Jedef Re. Join us in this video to delve into the history of this pyramid and the mysteries it holds. Discover the intriguing theories about the identity of the queen for whom this magnificent structure was erected. Don't miss the chance to dive deep into the Egyptian civilization and uncover the secrets of G1B in this exciting journey. Deep in the Egyptian landscape, just 10 meters south of its counterpart GIA, stands the enigmatic pyramid GIB. Similar in size and alignment, this ancient structure rises majestically against the backdrop of time. Constructed on uneven terrain, the surviving casing of Pyramid GIB reveals a fascinating aspect of its creation. The first casing course at the north equates to the third course at the south, showcasing a height difference of approximately 1.10 meters. Meticulous measurements were taken by researchers, who faced challenges in accessing certain sides of the pyramid due to modern obstacles. Despite this, they managed to measure the actual length of the east side, revealing a distance of 48.90 meters. Employing a similar procedure as they did with GIA, researchers calculated a horizontal plane from the northwest corner, providing a level base of about 47.10 meters. Remarkably, they suggest this corresponds to 90 cubits, mirroring the dimensions of its counterpart, GIA. As we venture to the southeast corner of Pyramid GIB, the ancient stones tell a tale of craftsmanship and precision. Here, the surviving casing stones, meticulously preserved through time, unveil a captivating revelation. According to meticulous measurements by Maragiolio and Rinaldi, the third course of casing stones at this corner aligns perfectly with the level of the first course at the northwest corner. A fascinating symmetry unfolds, where the stones at the southeast corner echo the ancient design found at the opposite end of the pyramid. This meticulous alignment showcases the mastery of ancient architects who sculpted these monumental structures with unparalleled precision. Imagine, centuries ago, skilled hands placing each stone with purpose, creating a seamless connection from one corner to another. The third course here, mirroring the first course at the distant northwest corner, weaves a story of architectural brilliance across the ages. As we turn our gaze to the northeast corner of Pyramid GIB, a revelation unfolds. Unlike its counterpart, GIA, this ancient marvel stands in remarkably better condition, a testament to the enduring legacy of Egyptian craftsmanship. The camera captures the intricate details with clarity. The stairs leading to the north entrance gracefully ascend, inviting us to traverse the same path as ancient Egyptians did centuries ago. The architrave over the entrance, a symbol of architectural finesse, proudly adorns the pyramid, hinting at the structural mastery of its builders. Here, at the northeast corner, we witness not just the exterior beauty but a glimpse into the very heart of the pyramid. One of the core steps of the superstructure becomes visible, a crucial element in the pyramid's construction, echoing the craftsmanship that has withstood the test of time. Let's transport ourselves back in time, to an era where these steps were freshly hewn, and the architrave was a newly placed testament to architectural prowess. The meticulous care invested in each detail speaks volumes about the reverence ancient Egyptians had for these monumental structures. Now we look to the southwest corner, where the ancient whispers of Egypt's past echo against the backdrop of GIA, weathered and bare. Yet, in the foreground, a smaller pyramid emerges, known as GID, discovered in 1991 during the removal of a modern road. The casing stones and entrance wall stones have been modernly reconstructed, providing a visual aid for visitors to imagine the grandeur that once graced this site. Today, GID is often referred to as Kufu Satellite Pyramid, yet the mystery lingers. It's crucial to note that there's no conclusive evidence attributing its construction to Khufu. Charles Regano proposes an intriguing argument, suggesting it might have been built during the reign of Khafre or Menkori. 
The narrative becomes more intricate as we explore GIIA, nestled by Khafre's pyramid. A structure strikingly similar to GID, raising the question, which came first? The mysteries of ancient Egypt unfold, challenging our understanding of the chronological order of these monumental constructions. Construction complexities abound around Khafre's pyramid, with the enigmatic cemetery GIS, a line of mastabas along the south side. Reisner assigned these to the end of Khafre's reign or the beginning of Menkori's reign, adding layers of uncertainty to the historical puzzle. In the heart of Egypt's ancient wonders, the stories of GID, GIIA, and the cemetery GIS intertwine. As we delve into the layers of time, questions outnumber answers, and the allure of the pyramids continues to captivate, challenging us to unravel the mysteries of construction, reigns, and the silent sands of history. As we cast our gaze along the northern side of Pyramid GIB, a unique landscape unfolds. The familiar sloping foundation trench, a hallmark of ancient Egyptian construction, runs prominently, adorned with surviving casing stones near the entrance. A closer look reveals an entrance strategically positioned higher in the superstructure, necessitating the inclusion of steps for those who sought passage. This architectural decision not only serves a practical purpose but also adds an element of grandeur to the pyramid's design. Maragiolio and Rinaldi's meticulous observations shed light on distinctive features. The wall and architrave blocks surrounding the entrance are notably smaller than those found in GIA, showcasing variations in construction techniques and artistic choices. Unusually, the entrance axis deviates to the west of the pyramid's north-south axis by approximately 3.40 meters. This intentional displacement adds a layer of intrigue, inviting us to contemplate the reasons behind such a deviation from the norm. Stepping into the realm of Pyramid GIB, a distinct architectural feature catches our attention, the entrance. Unlike its counterpart at GIA, the stones forming the ceiling and walls here are notably smaller, creating a unique visual impression. Noticeably absent is the overlying architrave that adorned the entrance of GIA. The entrance to GIB presents a different aesthetic, with smaller stones contributing to the construction of the ceiling and walls, providing a glimpse into the varied craftsmanship employed in ancient pyramid architecture. Maragiolio and Rinaldi's meticulous examination unveils intriguing details about the descending passage. They estimate the original floor length to be around 14 to 14.5 meters, a significant portion of which, due to the higher entrance location, was constructed using masonry. The finishing of the ceiling, Maragiolio and Rinaldi notes, took place after the laying of the architraves, evident in the lower bedding joints and rounded corners instead of sharp edges. Petrie contributes valuable information, providing an azimuth for the passage is approximately 3 degrees 20 feet plus or minus 10 feet. The bore of the passage adheres to the standard pyramid specifications, although its width slightly varies along its length from 1.10 meters at the entrance to 1.03 meters in the middle and 1.0 meter at the end, according to Maragiolio and Rinaldi. The visual before us offers a preliminary glimpse into the substructure design of Pyramid GIB. At the conclusion of the brief horizontal passage, we step into a turning chamber, distinct from its counterpart in GIA. Here, nuances in the architecture reveal a departure from the familiar. Notably, the ceiling of the turning chamber is elevated by approximately 35 centimeters. In a deviation from the design observed in GIA, the east wall of the turning chamber is angled, initially veering towards the southeast for 1.72 meters before returning to a north-south orientation for an additional 1.83 meters. Instead of a large niche, the chamber boasts a unique architectural feature, adding an element of intrigue to the subterranean labyrinth. Maragiolio and Rinaldi meticulously detail the turning chamber, measuring it at 2.78 meters north-south, 3.01 meters at its widest, south wall, and reaching a height of 2.40 meters at its zenith along the south wall. The chamber's floor slopes downward, halting approximately 1.13 meters from the south wall, where it levels off. Sir William Matthew Flinders Petrie, in his meticulous calculations, contemplates the practicalities within this chamber. In inches, he evaluates the feasibility of introducing a sarcophagus. His precise measurements offer us a glimpse into the considerations of ancient architects and their understanding of spatial constraints within these subterranean structures. Vise, while sparing on details, provides a historical account of his exploration of what he designates as the Eighth Pyramid. 
His findings include skulls, a bronze armlet, and a peculiar brown stone resembling part of a female hand. Vise notes the supposed connection of the pyramid to the daughter of Cheops, adding layers of mystery to its purpose. In the realm of Pyramid GIB, a distinctive feature unfolds beneath our gaze, a network of intrusive burials. As revealed in the floor image here, these burials manifest as extensive excavations, each telling its own story. Anthropoid-shaped cutouts, penetrating through the pavement and underlying rock, create an intriguing tapestry of burial practices. The floor image of GIB unveils what seems to be anthropoid-shaped cutouts, carefully carved through the pavement and into the rock below. These intricate features bear witness to the complexity and diversity of burial practices associated with this ancient pyramid. The journey into the subterranean depths continues through a short descending passage, measuring approximately 3.80 meters in length. Commencing some 89 centimeters behind the west wall of the turning chamber, the passage boasts dimensions of 1.15 meters in height and a width ranging between 97 to 98 centimeters, forming an angle of 29 degrees. Maragiolio and Rinaldi, delving into the nuances of Pyramid GIB, were intrigued by the inclined floor of the passage. Examining the remaining lining on the east wall of the burial chamber, they hypothesized that the inclined floor might not have been visually displayed in the wall lining. They suggested the possibility that the floor could have been leveled through the lining at an elevation of approximately 1.26 meters above the pavement. Noteworthy are the traces noted by Maragiolio and Rinaldi at the east end of the passage. These observations led them to contemplate the nature of the connection between the passage outlet and the burial chamber. Was it a short staircase or an inclined ramp? The mysteries deepen as we explore the intricacies of Pyramid GIB's subterranean architecture. In the exploration of Pyramid GIB, an intriguing puzzle emerges as we delve into the layout of the burial chamber and turning chamber. Maragiolio and Rinaldi's meticulous documentation reveals a curious feature in the rock-cut void for the lined chamber, presenting questions about its purpose and design. The plan indicates an unusual aspect. The space to the north of the line chamber appears oversized, with a substantial gap between the north rock wall and the finished lining of the chamber. Interestingly, the thickness of the lining on the south side contrasts sharply, being relatively thin at around 49 centimeters. Maragiolio and Rinaldi note that the north wall incorporates rough masonry filling behind it, a departure from the fine masonry used elsewhere. Maragiolio and Rinaldi proposed that this excess space to the north facilitated the maneuvering and placement of ceiling beams. They draw a connection to a similar excavation in the north wall of GIA, suggesting a functional role. However, this theory raises questions. Why wasn't a replicated hole used in other chambers? And why cut back the entire length of the north wall to an apparently excessive depth for beam placement? Sir William Matthew Flinders Petrie, a pioneer in Egyptology, offers an alternative perspective. He emphasizes the manageable weight of the beams used in GIA, suggesting that experienced Egyptian builders needed to ensure sufficient space for beam insertion, leveling, and secure placement. The complexities of the rock-cut ceiling height and the insertion of beams challenge the notion of an oversized space for beam maneuvering. Discrepancies in dimensions and construction lines further complicate the understanding of the chamber's original intent. Maragiolio and Rinaldi's detailed drawings suggest a square plan close to 10 cubits on each side, but Petrie's observations of red construction lines introduce an additional layer of complexity. In front of us now is the Pyramid GIC, raising numerous questions about its structure and construction. The partial map of this pyramid, GIC, presents a fascinating scene. Here, we find a square-cut rock void, yet behind the northern wall lining, there is no rough rock fill but rather an empty void about one meter wide. Questions arise about the purpose behind the burial chambers in GIB and GIC. Were the original intentions of the designers for these chambers to be larger? Or did circumstances dictate a reduction in their size? Perhaps the wider northern side was constructed first, with ceiling beams brought in and placed on top of the lined northern wall and backfilled. The distance suggests that the center of gravity of any beams would rest behind the northern wall of the chambers. The rest of the chamber is then constructed, and the beams are carefully moved across from their parking positions and engaged on top of the finished south wall. However, if this was the plan, why is there no backfill in GIC to help stabilize this wall, especially if ceiling beams were to be dragged across it? Unless the void had been filled with masonry at one time, but removed by searchers, 
I could find no detailed information on this void. As a layman, I find it shocking how little information we have about these pyramids, both regarding the substructure and superstructure. Ideally, all of them require modern surveys and more detailed investigations before we can even attempt to understand what is going on with these structures. As we delve into the intricate details of the burial chamber GIB, we encounter a tableau of dimensions provided by various authors, each offering a unique perspective on the structure. What stands out is the alignment between Reisner's measurements and those of Weiss, a consistency observed not only in GIA but also in GIC. One wonders, did Reisner utilize Weiss's dimensions and complement the missing details? The absence of a sarcophagus, or even remnants thereof, comes as no surprise, considering the interference of intrusive burials. The original sarcophagus, if it ever existed, might have been removed or fragmented throughout the course of history. Our exploration reveals a pavement not as substantial as that discovered in GIA, with Maragiolio and Rinaldi estimating its thickness at approximately 30 centimeters. The thinnest pavement is found in GIC, measured by Maragiolio and Rinaldi at 22 centimeters. Here we see the remnants of the chapel on the eastern side of the pyramid, we are transported back in time through Maragiolio and Rinaldi's meticulous reconstruction of these sparse remains. The chapel, now a mere echo of its former self, once adorned the west wall of the pyramid with two niches. These niches, nestled against the pyramid structure, held secrets and significance lost to the ages. Examining the architectural details, we observe the intentional construction of a thicker front wall, possibly measuring five cubits, contrasting with the side walls, estimated at four cubits. The entrance, strategically positioned in the middle of the east wall, beckoned visitors into a long, rectangular space. Maragiolio and Rinaldi, with their expert analysis, suggest a north-south length for the facade of 14.75 meters, translating to 28 cubits. Contemplating the inner sanctum, it is conceivable that its original design aimed for a space measuring 20 by 4 cubits. The surviving niche at the north end provides a glimpse into the meticulous craftsmanship, starting just one cubit from the north wall and spanning two cubits in width. To accommodate the sloping terrain, an artfully leveled platform served as the foundation upon which the chapel once proudly stood. Here, we uncover the west wall and the enduring presence of the northern niche, a testament to the once grand chapel on the pyramid's east side. The southern niche, now lost to time, is believed to have mirrored its northern counterpart in both size and symmetry. As we can almost envision the vanished southern niche, harmoniously aligned with its twin. These architectural elements, though weathered and eroded, whisper stories of a bygone era, where symmetry and meticulous design adorned the sacred spaces of the pyramid's chapel. As we explore the intricate details around the chapel platform, a fascinating block comes into view, its rear expertly angled to snugly fit against the casing. This block, resting on the chapel platform, aligns seamlessly with the second casing course, showcasing the craftsmanship of ancient builders. Standing at the chapel entrance, our attention is drawn to four slabs arranged in a north-south direction. Maragiolio and Rinaldi, in their meticulous examination, challenge Reisner's reconstruction of the chapel entrance as a corridor. They emphasize the lack of evidence for such a corridor but acknowledge the presence of signs indicating a foundation or pavement in the rock east of the chapel facade. Deciphering these ancient cues remains a puzzle. Contemplating the size and style of this chapel, one can't help but consider its potential existence on the platform by GIA. However, the extensive enlargement of the chapel by GIC, transforming it into the Isis temple in later times, raises intriguing questions about the possibility of later modifications being incorporated into the chapels of GIA and GIB. As we conclude our exploration of the G1B pyramid, we leave behind the echoes of ancient mysteries and architectural marvels. The journey through this enigmatic structure has allowed us a glimpse into the rich history of ancient Egypt and the stories encapsulated within its stones. Thank you for joining us on this captivating expedition. If you enjoyed unraveling the mysteries of G1B, don't forget to like, share, and subscribe for more adventures into the wonders of the past. Stay tuned for our next exploration, where we continue to unlock the secrets of Egypt's ancient treasures. Until then, happy exploring!